Hello, and welcome to Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Torella. And I'm your better, prettier, younger host, Tori. We're sisters who are obsessed with true crime and love gal palin with you about cases. You can expect the occasional curse word, lots of friends quotes, and all the 90s nostalgia. To get in on the conversation, check us out at KillerQueensPodcast.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Killer Queens Podcast, and we're on YouTube at Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. Okay, y'all, grab your Capri Suns or your Surge, and let's talk about some true crime. Well, welcome to episode 232. 32. Can you believe that? No. There are 500 episodes in the bank, I think. Holy. Like Patreon yeah. and main feed, you know, 232 out here, but a bunch more back there. Who would have thought? Dude, I know. Five years we've been doing this now. Wow. I Wild just thought, guy. yeah, I thought we would have been doing this for a couple months. Like, that, that was, remember when we used to do it? That was fun. I never mm-hmm. thought that people would even like it enough for this to be, we're at 232. I know. It's just crazy. Thank you, guys. I know. All right. Well, today, speaking of wild ride, uh, this case is a wild ride. And you know what? Go ahead and prep the old window. I mean, we're talking, forget your window. Mm-hmm. You've got to take out a wall. Take out an entire wall. You know what? Set it all on fire. Pull what? a Miley Cyrus and get a wrecking ball. Yeah. I'm not going to sing, but I really want to, but I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually really love that song, by the way. Uh, Same. It's a good song. It is a good song. Yeah. So we've got, um, we've warned you about your wall. Oh, and if you've never been here before, that whole window open thing is sometimes cases enrage you, different aspects of it so much that um, we just started saying, like, you're going to want to throw all your shit out the window at this because or, of how angry I mean, you are. Yeah, and it's not it's not limited to just the stuff in your room sometimes. If it's um, a family member, a loved one, a sure. dog even. Something that is has walked itself into your room and you're so mad that you just have to throw everything out, including your husband or whoever— mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm, their mm-hmm. fault that they came in there, but you, your hands are tied. You can't help that. So, exactly. I've, if I mean, I've said many times. I'll say it again. Tori and I recorded in the same room. Her ass would be right out that window, hundred times, <laughs> and I can't help that, you know, because it's well, just what I'm, has to happen. I'm the dummy that would keep coming back in. So, sure, exactly. So that's that. So this one is the window is simply not going to do it. You're not going to just want to have your window open. You're you've got to just get rid of like half of your home. You know what would be even better if you had like, if you and I were recording together and you had to throw me out the window? Remember those, um, they're like gummy, gooey things, but it's like a hand and it's on a string and it would stick to oh, stuff. Oh, uh-huh. If I was on one of those and you could just throw me out and then reel me back in and be like, nope, again. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Because then right. I, I wouldn't right. have to walk. You wouldn't have to come get me. It's like a whole thing. That is. That's that's just working smarter, not harder is what you're doing now. It's using your dipstick, Jimmy. That's right. Um, okay, so we do have some trigger warnings for this episode. We have drug abuse, overdose, missing child, suspected child abuse. I'd probably throw in there, like, there's going to be mentions of torture, mm-hmm. abduction, uh, mentions of homicide. Yes. And I would just say overall assholery. Mm-hmm. Lying their ass off. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's do a little over... Oh, um, and thank you to Madison for writing this up. Yay! Yay! We squeaked it in. We sure did. We didn't forget. Yes. Nope. But we always... um, We are always thankful. ABT, always be thankful. Exactly. Always. Yeah. So in June of 1994, 13-year-old Nicholas Barclay was reported missing by his mother. He was supposed to return home from a nearby park before dinner, but Nicholas disappeared without a trace. There were no signs of a teenager until his mother received a phone call over three years later from authorities in Spain. They said that they had found her missing son that had been held captive and abused for the last several years. Nicholas's family could not believe that he was alive and coming back to them. However, when Nicholas returned to Texas with his family, people noticed that things were off and that 
something didn't fit. People began to question if this was really Nicholas Barclay or if the real missing teenager was still missing. Nicholas Patrick Barclay was born on December 31st, 1980 to Beverly Dollar Hyde in San Antonio, Texas. His mother had a son, Jason, and a daughter, Carrie, from a previous relationship, and Nicholas's father's identity is unknown. The age difference between Jason and Carrie and the Nicholas was significant. So for most of Nicholas's life, Carrie and Jason didn't live with him in Beverly. They were already out of school. They were already out like living their adult lives. Like Carrie was almost, we watched the uh, documentary called The Imposter on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's also on some other stuff too, but that's where I watched it. I watched it. It was Amazon Prime with like a plug-in for Pluto TV. Oh, so you didn't have ads? No, I did have ads. Or did ads. you? Oh, okay. Yes. Well, I had a billion ads. Oh, okay. But I at first thought Carrie was his mom. Well, yes, I agree. Because I think that because of the age difference, she probably could have been his mother with the age difference, but she definitely provided a secondary mother role to him, I think. Yes, because for sure. She was just yeah. so much older, yes. So as a result, Nicholas often felt very alone, and he didn't have many male role models in his life. Nicholas had a troubled childhood and had grown into a very rebellious teenager. Beverly worked the graveyard shift at a nearby convenience store, so Nicholas was often left unsupervised. Beverly also was reportedly battling a heroin addiction early in her son's life. Despite Beverly's struggles, her daughter Carrie said that she was a really good mother and that they always had what they needed when they were growing up. At 13 years old, Nicholas already had a pretty heavy juvenile record and was familiar with the police in San Antonio. Most of his charges stemmed from breaking and entering, theft, and truancy. He once broke into a convenience store and had also threatened a teacher. Beverly was growing increasingly frustrated and felt completely helpless. She felt that there was no good way to discipline her son anymore. I mean, I know I went to school with a guy who, by the time we were in the seventh grade, was, and you'll know exactly who I'm talking about, he was already like 6'6". Like, he was huge. And he was very rebellious. And he backtalked his parents and he whatever. And, you know, he even said at school one day, he was like, what the fuck are they going to do to me? I'm bigger than they are. You know? Mm -hmm. Like... I mean, what do you do as your kids get older? Right now, I can kind of make my kids do stuff, but like right. at a and certain point, you know, I can just pick them up. Right. But sometimes like some traditional disciplinary actions don't work for certain children, like no. grounding, taking things away. Um, you know, some of those things just don't work for every child. So what mm-hmm. do you do? I mean, and you know, by the time you're 13... I think his mom did her best, but I think think there's a lot that he was missing. And I think that just by this point, that development in this attitude was kind of there, you know? Yeah, it almost seems like it was a little too far gone to have, you know, and I don't know, I've already said this once this morning, like, I'm a much better parent because I don't have, you know what I mean? Like, you know that saying, like, I was a much better parent before I had kids. Like, I understand that I don't have any experience or knowledge in this, but from an outside stand, an outside point looking in with them, it's like, ooh, maybe if, if whatever could have worked, maybe we missed the opportunity or something. Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah, I mean, like, I wonder if, yeah, because I think he did feel kind of abandoned in a way and maybe felt like, because I, I, I've seen this with other cases and things and just, you know, like, I mean, even people we've like grown up with and stuff, it's like, even though as a child, you know, we don't understand how the world works. We don't understand how money works. We don't under, you know, like all that kind of stuff really. So it's like, she had to work nights to make ends meet. Right. Mm -hmm. But he probably felt a little bit abandoned by that, even though she was doing what she had to do to take care of him. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and he probably wanted more attention and then began to act out and, you know, that kind of stuff. And then it becomes this, like, ingrained thing. And it's really nobody's, I mean, if you're a single parent, you've got to do what you got to do. Absolutely. And you're doing everything for your family and for your child. Exactly. Yeah. It's just just hard to understand as a kid. Well, sure. And then you've got all these hormones and emotions. and. Mm. um. Yeah, I mean, 
all the things. And he doesn't have a father figure in his life. I mean, it's just a lot of things, I think, working against him, unfortunately, at this age. Yeah, it, like, all led to this, I think. Yeah. And he was also really street smart. Um, He was not afraid to break rules. Um, Beverly said that Nicholas acted much older than he was. And, in fact, at 13, Nicholas already had three tattoos. I am amazed by that. Uh, Amazed is not the right word. I'm appalled. I don't know. I— Yeah. I think I'm coming, of course, we all come from our personal experience, right? And I'm thinking if I had gotten tattoos at 13. First of all, I don't think I would be here to tell the story because I don't know if I would have survived my parents finding that out. Yeah. Secondly, what would I have gotten at 13? Good God in heaven. Like, oh my gosh, you would have gotten um, a horse. (laughs) No, nah. <laughs> it's true. Just it's a big true. horse. <laughs> Just yep. Grand champions, the most beautiful yeah. horses in the world. Yes, I exactly. probably would have gotten um, my sixth grade boyfriend's name with oh, a heart. No, no. That would have been a mistake, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He had the letter J on his left shoulder, T on his left hand between his thumb and forefinger, and L and N on his outer ankle. I'm what having a mean? hard time figuring out what any of these letters could mean. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. And I mean, obviously, he didn't like go to a tattoo shop and his mom didn't sit there and give him permission to get all. It's probably just, you know, very crude tattoos that one of his friends did or something. But um, maybe he did to himself. I've heard of people doing that yeah. with like an ink pen. And yeah. Yeah. Beverly said that anytime she tried to discipline him, he would lash out, he would become verbally abusive, or he'd just run away. And sometimes he would even become physical during arguments with his mother. Feeling like she was at her breaking point, Beverly reached out to her son, Jason, and asked him if he'd move back in the home to help with Nicholas and give him a male influence in his life. Now, Jason also unfortunately struggled with drug addiction and anger issues, but he wanted to help his mom, so he agreed to move in. San Antonio police were very familiar with Jason as well and had reportedly responded to the home several times for domestic disturbances. And these probably involved Nicholas and Jason. In addition to responding to disturbances at the family's home, they were familiar with Nicholas frequently running away from home. He typically came home in a day or two. He was never gone for an extended period of time. On June 14th, 1994, Nicholas was scheduled to have a court appointment with his mother. This appointment was intended to discuss Nicholas possibly being placed in a group home. Beverly and the court hoped that having constant supervision that he would get in a group home would give him the structure and help that he needed to get himself on the right track. And it goes without saying that Nicholas was extremely resistant to this. He didn't want to lose all this freedom that he had while living with his mom. Yeah. Ugh. And I want to be clear about the fact that when I said it was too far gone, I don't mean that he was too far gone. I think that they're, I believe that all children have the. Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't mean it like that, but I just feel like all of these things led him exactly to this point. And I feel like. It yeah. Was just... I mean, these are formative years and these are th- like when we are very young, we build all of our protective. I mean, I'm still in therapy trying to break down barriers that I built when I was a child mm-hmm. to protect, you know, that's what we do. Like, yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. It's coping and it's just trying mm-hmm. to adapt to the world and the environment that you're in. Yep. So I just feel like just based on all of these things that he had to go through and overcome, it brought him to this point and that breaks my heart and no fault to anybody involved necessarily because they I think everybody was just simply doing what they could but it unfortunately led them here yeah yeah and I wonder too I mean if he was already and I'm speculating that he may have felt abandoned I mean he he did say some things to that degree you know but like If he was already feeling that way a little bit, like, because, you know, a lot of kids will act out for attention, right? So if he's doing this to get the attention of his mom or his family or whatever, and then he finds out, I'm going to be moved to a group home. Yeah. It's not because his mom doesn't want him. It's because she's trying to do what she thinks is going to help him in the long run. But he's 13. He doesn't see it that way. Well, and that can be misconstrued or in his mind feel like another form of abandonment. 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's just, uh, I don't, that's so sad. Yeah. So we're going to go to the day of the disappearance. And there are two varying reports about when Nicholas was last seen. Some say that he was last seen on the 13th and police were also notified of him being missing on the 13th. Um, other reports say that Nicholas was actually last seen on the 10th, but his mom didn't report him missing until the 13th. And because of the fact that Nicholas had a history of running away and then returning a couple days later, it could possibly be that it, he just wasn't reported missing until the 13th. So we're going to go with that. Mm -hmm. On June 10th, 1994, which was a few days before his scheduled court appearance, Nicholas left the house to walk to a nearby park to play basketball with his friends. Beverly gave her son $5 and told him to be back before dinner. And this was a typical day for Nicholas, especially when school was out. He made the one to two mile walk to and from the park, which he has done before. When he left for the park, he was wearing a white t-shirt, purple pants, black sneakers, and carrying a pink backpack. After his basketball game was finished, Nicholas called the house and asked Jason to ask his mom if she could come pick him up from the park. And Jason said that his mom was sleeping um, in the living room. He didn't want to wake her up. So he's like, just Nicholas, just walk home. After a few hours, it got dark outside and Nicholas is still not home. And it didn't seem abnormal for Nicholas to run away because his court date is coming up. So, and he's, this is something that he does not want to right. do, understandably. So he does not want to go to this group home. So Regardless of whether Nicholas was last seen on the 10th or the 13th, Beverly went to report her son missing on the 13th, and it seemed that from the beginning, police did not take things very seriously. They were familiar with Nicholas and his family and knew that it wasn't out of the ordinary for him to get angry with his mom and run off. But it doesn't seem like there were any organized searches for Nicholas after his disappearance. From reports, it seems that many believed Nicholas had run away from home for the last time, refusing to be sent to a group home. His family said that they continued to search for him, and Beverly said uh, felt that her son had been abducted. From what Jason had said, it definitely sounded like Nicholas was planning on coming home that night because he called and asked for a ride. So if he was planning on running away for good, why would he try to procure a ride home? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I could see that, but I could also see because he called and asked for a ride, and then he didn't get one, so he's like, Maybe that was like the straw that broke the camel's back for him. He was like, see, nobody even cares about me anyway, or something. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I mean, I think either are possible. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, unfortunately, we just don't know. Yeah, like, because he could have definitely looked at that and been like, okay, he's not, you know, I can't get a ride home. Nobody's coming to get me. Um, they're sending me to a group home. Like, fuck it, I'll just leave. Mm-hmm. I really, I have no idea, but yeah, we, yeah, we just don't know. But yeah, we don't know. Yeah. And Beverly said that her son was fearless and she believes that he would have gotten into a car with someone that he didn't know. On September 25th, 1994, about three months after Nicholas disappeared, his older brother Jason called the San Antonio Police Department and he was still living in the same ho house as Beverly. And he reportedly, or he reported that he saw his younger brother trying to break into their garage. And when he saw Jason, he ran. Police responded and searched the area, but they didn't find any signs of Nicholas, and they did not consider it to be a valid sighting. Both Beverly and police don't believe that Jason ever saw Nicholas that night. Months, unfortunately, turned into years, and Nicholas was still missing. But in October of 1997, which is almost three and a half years after Nicholas disappeared, Beverly and Carrie both received phone calls that would change their lives. You are not ready. You're not ready. No, no you're not ready. Get out your wrecking ball. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want everyone to see everything. Yeah, I know. Okay, so on October 7th, 1997, police in Linares, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, Spain, <laughs> received a phone call from a concerned tourist. And I don't need, like, just if you feel like you need a message, just to be like, this is how you say it, it's fine. We don't, it's not that big of a deal. Don't mean to say it wrong, but don't need. DMs about it either. The man on the phone said that he and his wife were visiting the city and had found a young boy, possibly 14 or 15 years old. Just, mm. okay. The caller said that the boy had no ID or documents on him and he seemed very scared. They'd offered him food, but he wouldn't take it. it sounds like a little skittish kitty cat that you find on the street. I know. Exactly. He asked if police could come to their location and check on the boy. And so a patrol officer was sent out to the scene and found a male dressed in a large coat with his hat pulled down low over his eyes. Police asked him questions, but he would not speak. 
finally, they were able to get him in the back of their police cruiser and take him back to the station. So police continued to try and get information from him to figure out who he was or how they could help him, but he wouldn't speak. Unable to get the boy to speak with them to find his identity, police had no choice but to send him to a local children's home, which is basically an orphanage. Like the police, the staff at the children's home were growing frustrated that he wouldn't tell them who he was. So they continuously told him that they needed to know who he was and where he came from. Finally, the staff told him if he didn't tell them who he was, they were going to fingerprint him and take his picture to distribute. This got him talking. He told yeah, the staff— it lit a fire right underneath that ass. Uh-huh. He's like, oh, shit. So <laughs> he tells the staff he's an American. I just—I wish you could hear his accent, but he says he's American. It's French as the day is long as the day is long, um, that had run away. And he was willing to contact his family, but he needed to do it himself on his own. He, they certainly couldn't have anybody in the room with him when he did it, mm -hmm. hands down. He didn't want his family to get a call from officials in Spain. He wanted to be the one to call his family. And so they were like, yeah, okay, makes sense. So he asked to be left alone in the office that evening because there's a time difference between Spain and America, and he needed to call at night. So Beverly gets this phone call, and she just cannot even believe it. And she immediately called her daughter, Carrie, who was at work. And Beverly was like, someone from Spain has Nicholas, and he wants to come home. And Carrie was like, obviously very excited, but really confused. Like, how in the world would he have gotten to Spain? Mm -hmm. So Carrie called the shelter in Spain to speak with someone who worked there. The man said that Nicholas was right there beside him, but he was too scared to talk. And the man said that Nicholas had been held by a sex trafficking ring, abused for years, and then escaped. And Carrie was adamant that she wanted to hear his voice. And finally, she heard a very soft voice say something to the effect of, I love you, like very kind of far in the background. After hanging up with the shelter, Carrie got in contact with the FBI headquarters in Santo San, mm, San Antonio. That's just saving saving valuable, valuable seconds. seconds. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, San Antonio, Texas. So special agent Nancy Fisher took her call and told Carrie they'd help her get to Spain and get her brother back, but he would need to be interviewed immediately so the FBI could, you know, try to find who abducted him. Nancy was shocked that Nicholas had been located. And, I mean, we all know this. To find a child that's been missing for years is rare. To find them in a different country is exceedingly rare. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't think of one case off the top of my head where that's happened. Right. The vice consulate in Spain heard that a missing American boy had been found, and he visited the children's home. When he arrived, he found that Nicholas was gone. Staff from the children's home began searching around the nearby area for him, and they finally found him on the side of the road trying to hitchhike. So the staff brought him back to the home where the vice consulate confirmed that he believed him to be American since he spoke English. Okay, if you hear him talk, you it's very obvious that English is not his first language. Absolutely. I mean, he has a very distinct accent. It's not... And I, I don't believe that he could even throw on an American accent because he never tried to, as far mm -mm. as I can tell. But mm -mm. yeah, it's it's very clear that he is not, he didn't come from an English as a mm -mm. first language speaking household Home. or something. Yeah. Yes. And like, you know, there are many, many people around the world can speak English. Everybody else is better about learning a different language than we are. <laughs> like, right. I don't know any other languages, but basically everybody knows English, I feel like. But right. When people from other countries speak English, sometimes, you know, they'll miss some of the, like, to hear him talk, to hear him speak, he would miss some small words that we would use, you know, just kind of the way that we would say things, mm -hmm. because there is a, a language difference. So it's not his first language. And so it's just very obvious to hear him speak that, he, like you said, he did not grow up in an English-speaking home. As, as a first right. language. Right, right. Yeah. So um, the next morning, the children's home director told Nicholas that his sister was on her way to Spain to take him back home. Carrie was nervous. She was excited and hadn't slept for two days. She tried to sleep on the plane ride to Spain, but she couldn't fall asleep then either. 
When she got to Spain, she was taken to the children's home where she finally, after more than three years, saw her little brother again. Carrie embraced Nicholas immediately and put her hands on his face, and she touched his nose, and she said, I remember that nose. You, you look just like your Uncle Pat. Nicholas was quiet. He didn't speak much until everyone left the room but Carrie, so it was just the two of them left. And she pulled out tons of family pictures and was going through them with Nicholas, and she's like, you know, just in case you've forgotten, this is this person, this is this person, this is what they look like now, like, all that kind of stuff. And... He actually commented on some of the photos saying, oh, you know, my brother's gotten taller. Um, Is grandpa still an asshole? Like, said things that made it seem like he knew what she was talking about, basically. Right. I mean, they're also vague enough to where he could, it's just. (laughs) Yeah. The is grandpa still an asshole thing is interesting. Like, I don't know if she said something that made him feel like that was appropriate or what, but because like. He took a know. shot with that one, but the, yeah, he took oh, a shot because well, if like gotten taller, that's all. Uh huh. Right? Yeah, that makes yeah that makes sense because if like you or I met somebody that was like our long lost cousin or something, and they were like, you know, if they said something to that effect, is Grandpa still an asshole? I'd be like, wrong. Get out of here. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know where he even. Yeah. Bold move, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off. It did. And it did, yep. Nicholas was quiet, but when he did speak, he had what Carrie described as a funny accent. The Spanish police and judge, however, were not completely convinced that Nicholas was who he said he was. So they said, we're going to interview him, but we're doing separate interviews. And the judge told him that they were going to have five photos of his family, and Nicholas had to correctly identify all the people in the photos. And he actually did correctly identify everyone in the first four photos, But by the time he got to the fifth one, he made a mistake. But nobody cared because he he identified the first four. They were like, okay, this is him. It has to be him, yeah. Yeah, so they took a photo of him for his brand new passport and made arrangements for him and Carrie to return to San Antonio. Nicholas Barclay was finally going back home. Hmm. They stayed in a hotel room that night in Spain and made their way to the airport the following day. Carrie said that Nicholas was very fidgety. He always seemed to be watching her, and she assumed that he was just scared. He'd been through so much trauma. As Carrie and Nicholas made their way off the plane and into the airport in San Antonio, Beverly approached her son. She grabbed his hand. She hugged him. She told him how much she missed him. She saw that he was very covered up, though. He had a scarf on his face, a big coat, sunglasses, and he had two hats on. One, they're baseball caps, but one's facing forward, and then one on top of it was facing backwards. So, um... (laughs) It was like, I'll be wearing seven hats today. It's like uh, in Friends <laughs> when Joey came out with all the clothes on. All the clothes, yes, exactly. He's like, He's like what um, are you going to— Look for the— You're going to show me my clothes? <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> opposite is opposite. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I feel like Carrie and Nicholas are like, hey, um, look for the guy with 19 articles of clothing on. That's where we'll be. Mm-hmm. Like, Yeah, on what? his head. Yeah. Right. And San Antonio. So oh, hot. Pretty hot. Pretty yeah, hot. I don't I don't know. Um, anyway. Whatever. The ride home was quiet, so they put on music. They were hoping to make Nicholas more comfortable. And everyone mm-hmm. was so excited, but they didn't want to overwhelm him. Because Beverly was still working nights, she didn't feel like she could provide the stable family environment that her son needed, so Nicholas went to live with Carrie, her husband, and her children. And Carrie thought the best thing for her brother was to get him back into a normal teenager routine. So they enrolled him in the nearby high school, where he quickly made friends. He started hanging out with them after school. He even had a crush on a neighborhood girl. They'd talk on the phone and hang out. He was just literally doing normal teenager things. That just— He pissed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, put put a pin in that one, guys. Put that's a pin disturbing in as fuck. It. Yeah, mm-hmm. but a Nicholas's girl. family. Uh huh. Yep. 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 Mm-hmm. yep. Mm-hmm. A high school teenage girl. Yep. Yep. Nicholas's family felt like he was starting to adjust, and they were just so happy to have him back. There was one person who Nicholas had yet to see when he returned, and that was his older brother, Jason. Finally. Jason made his way to Carrie's house to see his younger brother, and it was later said that Jason didn't look at him like Nicholas or even pretend to look at him like he was Nicholas. Jason said two words to him. He said, good luck, and then he left. And that's it. And that is literally it. 
FBI Special Agent Fisher wanted to interview Nicholas as soon as possible to start their investigation into the people who had abducted and held him captive. So on November 4th, 1997, Nancy met with Nicholas at the San Antonio Missing Persons Center to finally interview him. The first thing she noticed when he came in was that he did not look 16 years old. He looked much older. He had a shadow of a dark beard, like the five o'clock shadow, which mm-hmm. Nancy found odd because Nicholas had very blonde hair. Very blonde hair. Also, I feel like this situation is when we have all been made to believe, it's the same thing as all these rom-coms we've been watching growing up. And like, these are kids in high school, but they're really 35 years old. Like, Mm-hmm. The people playing them are 35 years old. You know, that's like exactly what is happening here. Yeah, exactly. He's like, no, I'm sick. I mean, this has never been kissed. <laughs> this is again. not another teen movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yes. Cool dude. <laughs> Nicholas was very nervous. He seemed extremely uncomfortable throughout the encounter, but he told Nancy the horrific story of what happened to him over the past three years. This is rough. Um, yes. But also take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. It's going to um, be tough to hear. And yes. we're not saying this has never happened to anybody, but don't just take it with a grain of salt. Yes. He said that he was talking to two other kids at the basketball courts on the day he went missing. And he said that someone from behind him put a cloth over his face, dragged him into a van, and then he passed out. They flew him overseas where he was kept in a room with many other kids. Nicholas said that he and the other children were physically and sexually abused by high-ranking military officials. The men who abused them were reportedly European, Mexican, and American. He said that the abusers broke both of his hands, one with a baseball bat, burned him with cigarettes, forced him to eat insects, broke his foot with a crowbar, and raped him. Nicholas said that the captors forced experiments on him and the other children, poking needles into their eyes, putting headphones on them at full volume with screaming, and changing their hair and eye colors. He said that they changed his eye color by injecting a solution into his eye, and this explained why... Nicholas used to have blue eyes, but now he has dark brown eyes. He also said that if they were beaten if they spoke English. And Nicholas said that one night a door was left open and he ran out and continued to run for hours until he discovered that he was in Spain. It seems very odd that these people would abduct him off the street, fly him overseas, and he claims at one point that they're military Mm -hmm. and that they would just fucking forget to close the door. And be like, oh shit, they all got out. Like, <laughs> I mean, people make mistakes, Torella. Like, Pe- people like make mistakes. Yeah. I also he, feel like humans. This is, yeah. And well, completely that's true. real. That's and com- true. Yes. There's, yes. I think one of them um, was George Glass. This is I think so too. Yes. But also, it's Corporal like uh, George Glass. Exactly. <laughs> like some kind of a spy movie. And he's like, so, uh, yeah, no, they, no, they injected, uh, they injected a solution in my eye that changed my eye color permanently. Yeah. Did it also make you 14 years older than you were when you disappeared? <laughs> right. Like I was literally going to say, so why do you have a five o'clock shadow? And he's like, oh, it was the <laughs> solution. That was a yeah. side effect of the solution. So like, I'm imagining just like a secret government lab and there's all these, you know, like in movies where there's jars with like the poison kind on it and it's like, you know, the skull and crossbones or whatever. Like Like there's all these like- Emperor's New Groove. Yes. So there's all these jars (laughs) of solutions and one of them is like eye color solution and one of them is like five o'clock beard, five o'clock shadow solution. And one of them is- One of them um, is like ear changing solution. One of them is- Ear changing, yes. Yes. And uh, (laughs) make you 14 years older than you were when you disappeared, even though it's only been three years since you disappeared. One of them is make you have a brand new accent that you've never Mm -hmm. been known to have before. Can't speak like an American ever again Mm -mm. after three years. Yeah, exactly. You better hope you don't get those bottles mixed up. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. You could end up with a five o'clock shadow when you meant to have a different ear color. Ear color. Mm. Ear color color or hair color? Ear shape. Eye color. Hair. What's happening? Ear I makeup. think you've mixed up your meds today. I don't know. What I sure have. Here. Yeah. I drank all the solutions just in case. Yeah. Um, okay. So Charlie Parker, a San Antonio private investigator, got a call in November from a TV producer who had heard about Nicholas's miraculous return and wanted to get an interview with him. 
They wanted Parker to locate Nicholas so they could get an interview. Would it, is it, was it hard to find him? He was doing all kinds of media interviews. Couldn't they just go the right over the fuck to their house? Like, can't, don't TV producers find, go to people's houses all the time and be like, hey, I want to do like, an interview? They, like, camp out and yeah. wait for them to, yeah, exactly. Like, I just, I don't think it was a secret where he was. I'm not sure where they had to get a private investigator, but anyway, they did. <laughs> um, so Parker was able to track down Beverly, and then an interview with Nicholas was arranged. Nancy had asked the family not to contact the media. She's the FBI agent because they're investigating Nicholas's abduction, right? And so he had told them that these military people did this. And so she's like, if any of that was accurate, if any of that was true, we needed them not to go parading around on the media because we don't need these people to know where we are in the investigation, basically. We don't want to mm-hmm. jack it up. So... They were like, cool, I'm going to do that anyway, though. So Nicholas told the interviewer his story, which wasn't that Connie Chung? It looked like her. Pretty sure it was Connie Chung. Man, I miss Connie Chung. Oh, man. Stand up lady. I know. Great hair. Classy. Oh, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. So he tells her exactly what he told Nancy during his FBI interview And I don't know if you noticed this. I feel like probably you did. But she did ask at one point, did they rape you or all the, like, the kids every day? He's like, oh, no, they didn't rape me um, every day. Some of the kids, they liked it more. So they would do, they would do the rape, like, two or three times a week. But not me. I didn't. Yeah. Like, he almost said it like they wanted to be raped more. Therefore, they got raped more. Like, Right. That really stuck out to me. And I was like, uh, I don't I don't know about that. Now, that could be a language barrier thing or I don't know. But I just thought it was super weird. Yeah. And I also found it to be very, very weird that he, his outfit of choice on this, like <sighs> the hat, the sunglasses, the leather jacket, the, I don't know. It's just... Yeah. I don't know. Why go on uh, on TV for an interview like that? And like, here I am. Com- I'm finally home. And he's like completely hidden again. Exactly. Yeah. It was very strange. And, you know, Charlie Parker is sitting there watching this interview. And he's like, okay, that something's not right here. And we're going to drop just a little bit of this interview in just so you can hear his voice. Like, you have to hear him speak. Yes. And I think if this sounds like we're not believing a word of this, it's because um, we're not believing a word of this. Exactly. It's not like we would. uh, Yes, we would never. This isn't attacking a victim at all. It's no calling out a perpetrator. So exactly. Yes. Yeah. June 19th, 1994, Nicholas got into a fight with his family, so he came here to Fort Sam Houston to play basketball. Two young boys approached him. He started talking. The next thing he knew, there was a cloth over his mouth, and Nicholas passed out. He claims his captors changed his appearance to make him unrecognizable. He was no longer allowed to speak English. Did they rape you all every night? Me? No. (laughs) Because they, they didn't trap me every night. Some of them, they like more. <laughs> Some of the kids, they like more. They wrap them usually um, two or three times a week. Okay. So do you guys hear that accent? Not That's... someone with an American accent. Mm-mm, mm-mm. That's French AF. Yeah. Um, there was also a photo nearby of Nicholas before he disappeared, and it caught Charlie Parker's eye. Nicholas had blue eyes, kind of like gray-blue eyes. They were a very like light mine. Mine color. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Minor ocean blue. Gorgeous. Most beautiful, beautiful blue like, there are. Yeah. Yes. Yours are like kind of And mine are cloudy with a chance of meatballs, kind of. Yeah. They're they're fine. They're not they're great. Fine. They're fine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just kidding. You have great eyes. Um, <laughs> but this guy had brown eyes. And Charlie Parker was like, as soon as that thought flashed through my head the hair on the back of my neck stood up and I was like, something is wrong. You cannot change the color of your eyes like that. This is not a spy movie. Like, this is not... Yeah. So he immediately asked for another picture of Nicholas prior to his disappearance so he could compare it to a still shot of Nicholas now from the interview. 
And in the documentary, he very proudly says, I put them in Adobe Photoshop. And then he was able to zoom in, which, I mean, honestly, he should be proud. Photoshop is difficult as fuck. And if this was 1997... Oh, that's true. Yeah. Wow. He's ahead of the time there. Yeah. So he zooms in on the ears in both pictures, and he said that he'd heard about Scotland Yard using this method to determine somebody's real identity because he's like, your ears don't change. And the two ears that he looked at were very different. He even says your ears are basically just like fingerprints. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that. There are also surgeries that you can have to change the appearance of your ears. It's called oh, sure. autoplasty. Like, well, my ears probably don't look the same because I you had your gauges them fixed with gauges. Yeah, yeah. But I would, I would go to venture that your ears look the exact same as you when you were a newborn baby because you have the tiniest little ears I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. I don't think That's those ears so have changed true. or grown at all. They haven't. I said you guys stayed just where you are, and they did. <laughs> it's like Morton the Moose. No, but you're the big me, moose me, with, me, the me, tiny, me, 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 <laughs> with the tiny little horns. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so his the ears are different. Okay, guys, that your ears never change. Scientific fact cannot change, and uh, these ears are different. And not one of them. It wasn't like the ears hung low. They don't wobble to and fro. It's not that mm-hmm. kind of thing either. But they're different. Couldn't tie them in a knot. Couldn't tie them in a bow. None of that. No. Mm-mm. So he immediately contacts Nancy at the FBI to report what he is finding. And he believed that this man was an imposter. And then he kind of went a little overboard. And he was like, and I thought he was a spy. <laughs> uh, I was damn sure he was a spy. Because why else... Would you come here and pretend to be somebody that you're not from another country unless you are a spy, for sure? Now, here's the thing, Charlie Parker. We already said it's not a spy movie. So quit trying to make the spy thing happen. Like, if he thinks he's a spy, then I feel like he would have been like, he probably did change his eye color. He's a spy. Probably. And then he'd be like, but he's like, you "Ah!" can't change your eye color. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) The whole thing, like, I don't know. Charlie Parker. Okay. I mean, he's... He's on to something here, but the spy thing is just a little over there. Right, but his imagination has gone run wild. A little bit, a little bit. And Nancy was like, thank you for letting me know about his ears. I certainly did not realize that scientifically your ears can never change, so thank you for bringing that to my attention. But um, you need to not intrude on a federal investigation, so shut the fuck up, (laughs) basically. And she was like, I didn't feel like— ears." Open yours and listen to this, you dummy. Yeah. <laughs> Don't come over here and talk to me about this. Talk to the hand. So, But she also was like, I didn't feel like I had a right to question this family who said, this is my son. This is my brother. Like, they were positive. And she's like, I also couldn't understand, like, why would somebody take in a total stranger mm-hmm. if it's not their actual family member, you know? I mean, it's, it is insane to me. But— I know. We'll discuss it further, but it's yeah. like, I, sad. All that being said, though, Charlie was like, whatever, this guy's going to blow something up at the military base. So just go ahead and get ready for that because he's 100% a spy. At this point, Nancy is still looking into all the information that Nicholas had given to her, but it was difficult as he, like, he gave a lot of really distinct details about they did this, they did that, they did this, but nothing else. He couldn't tell. He had no timelines. He had no, even like this happened in the day or this happened at night. He had no descriptions of anybody. He had no, no places. He said he never knew where he was. You know, he had nothing. It was just vague. So Mm -hmm. she arranged for um, her and Nicholas to fly to the Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. And she told the family that because he'd experienced trauma, she wanted to take him to see a forensic expert to deal with that trauma. Good one, Nancy. Exactly. So the doctor who evaluated Nicholas said that he thought the boy was being brought here for the doctor to assist with finding out who had abducted him. But as soon as Nicholas started to speak, his concerns became much more serious. And he asked him to repeat the stories that he had told of his captivity. And the doctor observed him during these stories and did not see any physiological changes that you'd normally see with someone who's discussing a traumatic experience. He had no change in his posture, uh, pupil size. He didn't have an increased heart rate. Also, Nicholas could speak English, but he could not do it without a heavy French accent at all. 
And the doctor said that he felt confident that a child could not be raised for the first 13 years of their life in an English-speaking home in Texas. And these are people who are who are Americans. Like, it's not like they were French people who lived in Texas. Like, Right, because I, I know that there are Americans that have accents, but it's, yeah. you know, this is not what we're talking about. These are here, people though. with it's, just Southern. If they have an accent, it's just Southern. That's all there is to yes, it. Like, that's all yeah. they have. And so he's like, you don't spend your, your first 13 years in an English speaking home like that with English being the first language and everybody around you having a country Southern accent. And then you're gone for three years and you can't speak English without the French accent. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't even in France. He was in Spain. Yep. So he calls Nancy and he's like, yeah, this child was not raised in an English-speaking home. There's just simply no way. And that was enough for Nancy. She immediately called Carrie and relayed the doctor's findings to her. And Carrie was stunned. Nancy told her that she didn't have to be at the airport in San Antonio to meet them, that she did not have to take this person back to her house. And Carrie agreed. So as Nancy and Nicholas deboarded their plane and walked through the San Antonio airport, they saw Carrie standing and waiting. She was so excited to see Nicholas and acted like the conversation between her and Nancy never, ever happened. What? Like, yeah, because she was like, okay, yeah, I get it. And then she just still showed up anyway. Nancy immediately contacted the U.S. attorney to ask them what to do, and they told her to let him go to Carrie's home temporarily. Carrie later said she didn't remember Nancy putting it into those words. Nancy, but Nancy says, I told her, this is not your brother. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know which, uh, yeah, I don't know which one to believe here, but it is bizarre that she mm-hmm. seemed to have sounded stunned and shocked on the phone. And then she was like, go and pick up. So what time do you want me to pick it up? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So private investigator Charlie Parker did not care about the rules. He was determined to figure out what was going on. He began interviewing neighbors about Nicholas and his family and why they thought he might have left, possibly of his own volition. So one neighbor said that the police would come to their house two to three times a month because of loud arguments between Beverly and her kids or her boyfriend. Nicholas was also known to cause trouble and often came home late at night. And this convinced Parker to do, or even more, that something else may have happened to Nicholas. Nancy was doing her best to obtain DNA samples from Beverly and Nicholas. Beverly was adamant that she would not give blood for a DNA comparison. And Nancy even said that Beverly laid down on the floor and yelled, you can't pick me up, you can't make me. Beverly later denied refusing the DNA um, requests. And Nancy could not understand why the family would let a stranger into their home unless they had something to hide. Okay, guys, just if you haven't picked up on it, which I think you have. We don't really have Nicholas Barclay here. Mm-mm. But what's about to happen to the family, so like that's infuriating. What's about Absolutely. to happen to the family is double infuriating. So again, I just implore you to get your wrecking ball out because all your shit's about to go out the window. Mm-hmm. All of it. Oh yeah. Get it ready. One of Nicholas's childhood friends told interviewers that Nicholas's home and home life changed when his older brother Jason moved in, and he seemed to think that Nicholas and his mom were pretty close prior to that. Jason struggled with drug addiction, like we talked about earlier, and Nicholas's friend believed that his moving in pushed Beverly to start abusing drugs. He said that Jason was a bum and a drug addict who only cared about himself. His words, not ours. Meanwhile... Much to Beverly's dismay, Nancy had obtained a warrant for blood collection from her and Nicholas, and she also collected fingerprints and palm prints that she sent to embassies and Interpol. She noticed that Nicholas was becoming more and more agitated, and she was scared that he might run away. But have no fear. Mm -mm. Charlie Parker is here. And he started tailing Nicholas to make sure that he didn't try to flee. On March 3rd, 1998, an FBI office in Madrid, Spain, called Nancy and confirmed what she suspected. This man was not Nicholas Barclay. They faxed her the records they had. I know, right? (laughs) Can't believe it. They faxed her the records they had, and she was shocked at what she found. Meanwhile, Parker met up with Nicholas for breakfast. They both ordered hotcakes. Parker said to Nicholas, you really made your mother angry. Much to Parker's shock and disbelief, the young man responded with, she's not my mother and you know it. What? Where was this? 
ha ha. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he told Parker that he wasn't Nicholas and that he was, in fact, a 23 year old Frenchman wanted by Interpol. 23, y'all. Remember he was dating a high schooler? Mm-hmm. Gross. He knew he was 23, okay? He was uh, 23, he the whole and he knew it. The whole time. Mm-hmm. The whole time, yeah. They faxed information that Nancy received from Madrid authorities. Um, nope. That's not that sentence at all. <laughs> The faxed information that Nancy received from Madrid authorities told her that the man who had claimed that he was Nicholas Barclay was actually Frederick Pierre Bourdin, a serial imposter from France. Where are all of these imposters coming from? We have the Tinder swindler. We have um, the puppet master document. Like all these people are just like, I mean, is impo- like when you fill out a, an online form, is imposter one of the possible occupations you can pick now? Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. Podcaster isn't even on there, but I guess imposter is. Uh, I don't know if imposter is, but possibly swindler or um, bamboozler. Mm. Yep. Okay. Con man. He was wanted by authorities for traveling throughout Europe and pretending to be countless different children. Okay. Can we? He does not look like a child. He doesn't look Mm -hmm. like a child. He doesn't look super old, but he looks fucking 23. (laughs) Like, yeah. He, he certainly doesn't look 16. Right. Yeah. He began these impersonations as a child and claimed that he'd assumed over 500 different identities. And y'all, if you watch The Imposter, you will see how proud of himself he is. Absolutely. About having achieved this. Yeah. So proud of himself. So here's what really happened. On the night of October 7th. It's like the movie Clue, where it's like, but here's what really happened. Oh my gosh, it is. And then you go through the whole thing, remember? I am your singing telegram. Anyway. On October 7th, 1997, Bourdain put his plan into motion. He used a payphone to call the police in Spain, telling them that he was a tourist who'd found a young man outside who seemed really scared and wouldn't speak. Y'all? Okay. He's he is Tilda Swinton. I have to do it. The whole time he was the whole time he was the whole time. Like <laughs> everybody, everybody in this. Yeah. He plays everybody. So it's Tilda like Swinton. at the yes. yeah, at the end in the credits, and they're like the man who found the kid on the street played by and Tilda Swinton. And then the um oh, he also was the guy who worked at the children's home, Tilda Swinton. Like he plays everybody. Mm-hmm. It's insane. So he hung up the phone. He made sure that he was very well covered. He had a large coat and hat pulled down almost over his eyes. He knew he had to be convincing. This was absolutely not his first rodeo. So when the police get there, they're expecting a child. So he behaved like one. He said that he wanted to provoke a sense of guilt of being like adults around a scared child. So they took him to the police station where he wouldn't talk, but he intentionally gave the impression that he'd been abused without saying so. He said, he said, I couldn't come out and say that I'd been abused. I had to make them figure that out. (laughs) It's awful. And he's like, I knew they wouldn't be able to like get a read on a kid who's not going to speak. So he just didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. He's so manipulative and he knows exactly what to do. He knew that they couldn't keep him in the police station, that they'd have to send him to a children's home. And that's exactly what he wanted. Now he says... Quote, for as long as I can remember, I wanted to be someone else, someone who was acceptable. Nobody ever gave a damn about me. So he says he wanted to be in a place where people cared about him. Sir, what you go on to do is the opposite of that. Like, Mm -hmm. that's not what you're trying to get here. It's almost like a a Munchausen's or something where like mm-hmm. he's like getting off on the attention or whatever it is. But like, mm-hmm. don't act like I'm just looking for love. You could meet somebody. I'm sorry that your home life was not, was not, I well, don't even want to say ideal. It was more. not good. Yeah. But right. everybody has a choice in how they react to things in life. And you can either use that and make good choices and choose not to also hurt people or you can turn around and just hurt everybody around you. But he had every opportunity to meet other people in his life who loved him. Mm -hmm. He just chose not to. Well, yeah. I mean, I can have 
empathy for somebody who feels that way. But Mm -hmm. then he goes on to do things that are absolutely deplorable. Absolutely. Yeah. Like we can feel sad for the child that he was because he didn't have a good upbringing. But I mean, his his family essentially just like got rid of him. Like they didn't want to have anything to do with him. And I I absolutely hate that for him. And that is heartbreaking. But you just fucking wait, you guys. Just fucking like not (laughs) even the pretending to be Nicholas is not the worst thing that he did. Mm hmm. And I can't even believe I'm saying that. And how was that possible? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So he knows they're going to have to send him to this children's home. So they bring him there, and he easily fit in and said he felt like he was reborn. And when the judge and police eventually threatened him with taking his photo and fingerprinting if he didn't give him his name, he knew he was either going to go to jail or he'd have to prove that he was someone. Also, like, it wasn't like he was being arrested and then came up with this plan, which still doesn't make it right. He was just on, he was just hanging out and was like, I'm going to call the police and, like, I'm going to put myself in police custody to try and do this. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. It's just crazy. Um, mm-hmm. So that night, as he sat in the office alone, after he promised the staff he'd call his family, he used that phone to call police stations throughout the United States. And he gave them a fake name. He told them he was a police officer in Spain, that they'd found a missing child that was from America, but they didn't sure where. They didn't sure. They weren't sure. Know, they didn't like- know. <laughs> 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 they didn't know, and they were not sure where he was from. I just wonder why he picked America specifically, because how was he going to pull that off with his accent? I mean, I think that you would think he he would know, I've got an mm-hmm. accent. Yeah. I think for him, he thought if he could just get himself to America, he he's not wanted in America, maybe. Okay, yeah. But yeah, that, I mean, he's he's facing a mountain here. Yeah. He fucking climbed He's getting it, it I mean, biting off a little too much more than he can chew. Yeah. Too much more than he can chew. That's right. Too much more. <laughs> um, so he starts calling all of these police stations. And the police were like, look, we have hundreds of missing people. We can't go through every single flyer that we have. So let's get you over to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So when he calls the Nick they told him the same thing, or he told them the same thing. I've got this kid in Spain. He's like 14 to 15 years old. He described himself, but he was intentionally very vague so that he could fit many descriptions. And the call taker was like, actually, this could be this boy that's missing from San Antonio, Texas, named Nicholas Barclay. And he's like, great, fax me over this kid's Missing flyer, description, like all this kind of stuff. How did this end up in his hands? Does he go to the front desk and is like, hey, I talked to my family. They're going to come get me or whatever. Um, But they're also going to fax me something. Listen, the office that they showed, and this is not a reenactment, but the office that they showed on the imposter looked as if it had phones, it had computers, it had fax machines, like all these things inside of the office. In the office. It just seemed like he had a full mm -hmm. run of this place and was able to get like access to their fax machine. Like he's he's acting like he's running this place and people are believing him. And then Mm -hmm. he's just like, he just seems to have access to everything. It's just incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they faxed it all over. The picture was black and white, but since he'd been missing for over three years, he would obviously have some change in his appearance. So he decides, you know what? Fine, I'm going for it. And he's like, yep, that's who we've got here. We've got Nicholas Barclay, 100%, no questions asked. Mm -hmm. So that same night, we know Carrie was contacted, who then called the shelter to speak with the staff. So the man that she spoke to was actually Bourdain, who pretended to work there and that Nicholas was right next to him. So he spoke quietly as Nicholas on the phone, not wanting to give her any reason to think that the voice didn't belong to her missing brother. There are so many opportunities. Yes. For Frederick Bourdain to be like, oops, should have stopped there. Uh Whoops. This is too far. Yeah. Yes. So the next day, the Nick Mick sends over a colored photo of Nicholas. And Nicholas was like we said, very blonde, with blue eyes. And he's like, fuck. The picture I got was black and white, so the hair color could have been dark. This kid never had dark hair, and he doesn't have brown eyes. I'm screwed. Like, you know? Mm -hmm. 
he knew that when the vice consulate came to see him, he was going to get arrested. The only thing that matched Nicholas was a small gap that they both had between their two front teeth. So Frederick Bourdain makes the decision. He's just going to do everything he can to give himself a chance. He bleached his hair blonde and found a girl in the group home who gave tattoos. And he had her give him the same ones that Nicholas had. It is in incredibly difficult as a former hairstylist to lighten your own hair with something that you find at the store and it mm-hmm. look passable as a a natural blonde. Yeah. Um, and I'm guessing I'm like say. at the children's home, do they, I don't know how these work, but they just get to come and go as they please. Like he's just like, hey, I'll be back later. I don't know. But like he went out and bought stuff to change his hair color. And then like Nobody thought, well, this is weird. He's changing everything about himself right before these people come here to verify who he is. Yeah. What? I don't know. I know. I know. I know. So, um, you know, then he puts on a large coat, sunglasses, the hats to keep himself as hidden as possible. So after Carrie gets there and she shows him all the photos, he was easily able to pass that photo test that the judge gave him. And when they went to the hotel in Spain that night, he said he thought several times about running away. Yeah, right. But ultimately decided to go home with Carrie. And he was like, I don't, I was just trying to figure out, am I doing the wrong thing? Am I doing the right thing? Like, that's not even a question here, sir. And then, you know, he gets to Texas and he's like, I thought somebody would be like, this is not Nicholas. But they all were just like, hey, Nicholas. And he said that he was so thankful to have a family and feel loved and everything seemed to be going well. His only concern was that the real Nicholas could come back at any time. But other than that, they think I'm him. So yeah, we're we're golden here. Mm. Bourdain was arrested and charged with perjury and fraudulently obtaining a passport and sentenced to six years in prison. Six. He's wanted by Interpol. Yeah, what was he wanted for? Like, I mean, I I don't know. I, but it doesn't seem like when he gets deported, he goes to jail again. I don't think he does. I don't, know. I don't understand Mm-mm. this, but whatever. No. But he still wasn't finished with Nicholas's family. While in prison, he contacted the San Antonio police and told them that he believed that Nicholas's family killed Nicholas. He said, quote, some of them did it, some of them knew of it, and some of them choose to ignore it. Why in the world is anybody listening to a fucking word that comes out of his mouth? I know. He is a known and, um, you know... You can't be more of a liar than this guy is. Like, Yeah, I mean, he's been prosecuted for being a liar. Yeah, what did we just arrest him for? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, and they were like, what? (laughs) We're going to look into this Mm because I think this whole matter here. Yeah. Yeah. Shortly into his stay with Carrie, he stopped worrying that the real Nicholas would return. And when he met Jason, he felt confident that Jason knew he wasn't Nicholas, likely because he knew that the real Nicholas was dead. He became even more suspicious of the family's involvement when Beverly fought so hard against DNA comparison. Bourdain said that he felt like Carrie was trying to make him remember things, saying, quote, no, not for a second did she believe I was her brother. She decided I was going to be her brother. Bourdain even said that Beverly once confessed to him that she and Jason had killed Nicholas and hid his body, and Beverly denied all of this. Last thing they need is for the person who literally took the worst experience of their lives and made it a billion times worse. Uh Uh-huh, multiply it. And then he's going to shit in their face after all of that. Yeah, like 100%. It's it's just horrific. Mm -hmm. Beverly said that they killed. Like, I know that Nancy didn't like Jason's response that he didn't seem that upset or that worried about, you know, whatever. But if Jason was very deep in the throes of addiction, he's not going to rock. Like, it's very possible that he was just like, honestly thinking about his next hit Mm -hmm. and being like, you know what? And maybe he, he wasn't not, even close to Nicholas. Like I hate to say right. that, but you know, it's this is not the kind of family 
that necessarily is rainbows and butterflies, you know? So like maybe Jason wasn't that worried that Nicholas was gone because Nicholas caused a lot of trouble for him. And you know, like, I don't know, but it didn't seem like they were that close there. I'm just, there are other explanations for why Jason may not have been that Reacted concerned. the way that, sure, absolutely. Yeah. And I don't think that to jump to, well, they had something to do with his disappearance without any proof or knowledge. And then to believe this ass hat of a person who has literally <laughs> fucked everything up for him, his own personal gain. Yes. And lied to so many people convincingly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, he's probably telling the truth now, right? Well, sure. I mean, stranger things could have happened. I don't know. Mm-hmm. A homicide investigation was opened by the FBI because of Bourdain's statements. Why? <laughs> P.I. Parker, private investigator Peter Parker, <laughs> agreed with Bourdain. He believed that Nicholas was buried in the yard of his childhood home. Again, this Parker, this is the same person whose ear is clearly different than the other ear. But you believe him now? He's a spy who is going to blow up government buildings. Yeah. But you're going to trust his, you're going to trust, you're going to trust what he says. So what you're yeah. going to do. Exactly. Okay. Nicholas's family obviously could not believe what had happened. Carrie said that her first emotion was complete sadness because it wasn't her brother. Where was the real Nicholas? But the second emotion, and this makes me so sad. She said, mm-hmm. quote, how could I be so fucking stupid? Mm. I don't think that that's fair. I do not think that that's fair to put on mm-hmm. yourself Somebody I mean, deceived you and, yeah. you and you wanted it so badly. Exactly. They have every, I mean, we've heard other cases where, you know, people have, have seen pictures of, you know, a missing loved one or like, you know, pictures of a possible sighting of a missing loved one or heard a voicemail that could be the voice of a missing loved one. And like other people around them will be like, that's not them. That doesn't sound like them. That doesn't look like them, whatever. But the parent or the, you know, whatever will be like, yep, I'm sure that's him or her or whatever. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, you want it so bad. Yeah. Of course. I don't fault them at all for for being deceived. And guess what? This guy is a career con man. So he knows how to do it. He's claimed to have done it over 500 times. So exactly. He, like we said, it's not his first rodeo. It's scum of the earth this guy is so yes and carrie also said in no way did she believe that her mother and brother had anything to do with nicholas's disappearance no prior to borde's arrest nancy attempted to get a hold of jason to talk to him about the situation and it was difficult to get in touch with him but when she finally did she said he was extremely apathetic didn't seem to care that his brother had returned and he told nancy that he knew it wasn't nicholas but didn't care enough to tell his mother and sister He was extremely hostile and refused to help at all. Unfortunately, not long after, Jason, who continued to struggle with alcohol and cocaine use, left a drug rehab center and he died from a drug overdose. And it was unknown if the overdose was intentional or accidental. Beverly said she cannot imagine Jason ever doing anything to hurt Nicholas. And Carrie said that since he's dead, he is the perfect scapegoat. He cannot be questioned. He can't defend himself. And Carrie said that their family wasn't hiding anything. They were the only ones who actually looked for Nicholas. Guess what, though? Bourdain's not done. He's in prison, Mm -hmm. and he made hundreds of collect calls from his cell, claiming that he had information to help solve missing, missing children's cases. And then he admitted to an interviewer that he had no, he had no information. He's just making shit up and calling Mm -hmm. people to Prey on the hope that that what what are we doing here? Yeah, exactly. What are I we don't doing? Get it? Here? Yes. And he's just like, uh, she's like, so you never had any information? Any information he's like, actual to give? Mm. Nah, no, Mm-mm. nope. Yeah. Is this just fun for you? Yeah. Is this equivalent? Your equivalent to prank calling? Like this is these are people's lives. It's so Their hopes awful. and dreams. The worst thing that's ever happened. Okay. All right. So, Bourdain was deported back to France in October of 2003. And three months later, he tried to steal the identity of a missing 14-year-old boy. Then he did it again and again. And in 2007, he married a woman in France. They have five children. And as far as we can tell, he's still living in France. Nicholas Barclay is still missing. And unfortunately, though Bourdain's 
impersonation brought attention to Nicholas's disappearance, the most important question is often forgotten. What happened to him? He was 13. What happened? Many people believe that Jason was behind his brother's death and that Beverly knows what happened, but unfortunately nothing has been found and his whereabouts are still unknown. It's so sad. It is. It's infuriating. Um, It's tragic. It's sad. It's all the things. And, I mean, for this poor family, too, like, when they started looking into Nicholas's disappearance as a homicide because of something that a big fat liar said to them, Mm -hmm. they immediately treated them like perpetrators, like suspects. They, Nancy wanted Beverly to have a polygraph test because that'll tell us Mm -hmm. if she's lying or not, right? And she passed it. And so Nancy was like, nope, wrong, do it again. She passed it again. Nope, wrong. Do it again. The third time she failed. Okay, that's more like it. Now, now we know she's telling the truth because this time she failed. What the fuck? (laughs) What the fuck? Once law enforcement has you in their sights, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do to get them off your back, I don't believe. I mean, I think that it's it's unfortunate. They, because Carrie says in The Imposter, where is the proof? Where are they getting this from? Why do they believe this happened? Because a known liar said that? Like, mm-hmm. but they, it, it appears as if they're not letting it go as far as what I could gather from the documentary. And it's, it's really sad because they have been through hell and back. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. now they're having to deal with this additional trauma. I just yeah. don't. And the only reason that he's not continuing to impersonate people, I mean, he says it's because he um, loves his wife and his children and he couldn't, you know, do that to them or whatever. But the only reason he's not continuing to impersonate people is because he is balding now. Like he's, I mean, he's in his 40s now. He can't pass as a 15 or 16 year old kid anymore. And when he started actually going bald, he was like, well, people aren't going to believe me. Right. And he'd been on TV so much that this woman who he's now married to saw him on TV and that's how they met. And they got married because she saw a guy who has literally lied about everything. And she's like, I'm going to marry that guy. I don't understand that, but... I guess that's not for me to get. No. And if you look like at the, um, I, get, I don't know if it's the Charlie Project that did this, but you know, they'll do the like age progressed photos. Oh, yes. Um, of children who are missing. So we'll share that too, just so that, you know, I mean, if you've seen anybody that looks like this, he could, he could be anywhere if he's still alive. But there is an age progressed photo of, you know, when he went missing in 1994 and then what he would look like around 2006. He'd be in his 20s. This looks, I mean, it could not be more different than Frederick Bourdain. Like, Mm -hmm. could not be more different. I'm angered by the whole thing, but... Yes, the whole thing. So, sorry if all of your belongings are now toast. Yeah. But thank you guys so much for hanging out with us and listening and let us know what you think about the case. Um, And of course, keep your eyes peeled we still have to figure out what happened to Nicholas. But anyway, we just want to thank you for listening and we hope you have a great day. We love you. Bye. Love you. Bye. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this case. Connect with us on Instagram or Facebook to continue the conversation. Thanks for listening and we will meet you back here next week. Bye. The theme song for the show is created and composed by Stephen Toby. You can find more of Stephen's work on SoundCloud. Our logo was created by Sloan Williams of Sophisticated Crayon. You can find more of her work on Etsy. Visit us at killerqueenspodcast.com for merch and other info about the show. 